Now, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to hear the Reverend Dr. Stephen Ferris speak at St. Andrews in Moncton. That year, he was the uh, moderator for General Assembly. And during his chat with us, he gave away $20 as an object lesson. And I'll explain why he did that later in my message, but it fit with today's gospel lesson, and so I wanted to do the same. Our reading from Matthew today continues to touch on the theme of resolving conflict or forgiveness, which I understand you uh, reflected on last week. In our reading, Peter asks a question that often crosses the mind of many Christians. How often do we need to forgive? Not only how often do we need to forgive, but how often do we need to forgive the same person? Jesus' answer isn't meant to be taken literally as though we must forgive someone 77 times or even 70 times 7 times, which is what some biblical translations would suggest. Rather, Jesus' point is to teach Peter that forgiveness is grounded in grace. And he uses the following parable to help explain his response. In the parable, Kathy read how Jesus speaks of a king who wished to settle his accounts with his servants. When he started balancing the books, he learned that one servant owed him 10,000 talents, which is quite a large amount of money. It was far greater than the tax revenue for all of Syria, Phoenicia, Judea, and Samaria. There was no way that this servant could ever pay the king back. As was the king's right, he could have sold the servant's possessions, as well as the servant himself and his family, to try to recoup the debt that was owed. He could have kept him in prison until it was paid off, which basically would have been a death sentence because there was no way he could pay it off. But when the servant pleaded for mercy, the king did something unexpected. He released him from prison, and he forgave the debt. Jesus doesn't tell us about the servant's immediate reaction to this extravagant gift of grace. But he is quick to point out what happened next when the role was reversed, and the servant found himself in a situation where he was owed money. When the servant's servant sought mercy for the payment owed, the forgiven servant refused, and he threw the guy into prison. When the king had heard about his actions, he was furious. After all, he had forgiven this servant, and the servant wouldn't do the same for another. So he threw that servant into prison and said that he'd stay there until he repaid the original debt. Indeed, the message is clear. As we are forgiven, we are called to forgive. As we are forgiven our sins, as we are forgiven our debts or trespasses, as we pray in the Lord's Prayer, we are commanded to forgive others also. You can't have one without doing the other. But, there being parable, this, this passage containing a parable, it does leave me with some questions. Now, Matthew interprets this passage as an allegory, with the king representing God, and us representing the servant. But, the problem with that interpretation is it makes me wonder, well, if God is the king in this story, does God unforgive people? Because in the parable, when he heard about the forgiven servant not being gracious and merciful to the other individual, he threw the servant back into jail, and he reinstated the amount owing. Almost looks like a case of double jeopardy, or a revoked pardon. But I don't think that's what the parable is saying. The king didn't impose any explicit conditions when he forgave the servant. Rather, I think the decision to punish the forgiven servant later was not a result of the original sin, but rather a result of abusing the king's grace and not being merciful to others. That the forgiven servant didn't show mercy begs the question, did the servant really accept the king's 
gift of grace in the first place? Is there something that this parable teaches us about the way, about how we receive grace and what we do with it? Now, let's get back to the matter of this $20 gift. Now, Stephen Ferris mentioned that he's done this exercise with many congregations. And the reactions are usually the same. People are surprised, some don't want it, some commit to, you know, sharing it with others and doing good with it. You might even wonder, well, what did I do to earn that $20? Why did I get singled out? Was it because I was middle of the pack, the aisle seat? Why? Why didn't I choose somebody else? Why not just take the shorter route and go to the choir? (laughs) That's probably what they're asking. (laughs) Why not somebody else? Why not you? Or you? Or way back? Like, maybe you felt a little uncomfortable being singled out. Surprised. Now, in his particular object lesson, Stephen was making reference to what is one of my favorite passages from Luke. Do you remember these words of Jesus to his disciple? Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. In other words, how do we receive the kingdom of God? How do we receive God's grace? Stephen pointed out that he had asked somebody, that had he asked somebody to rake his lawn and maybe clean up the gutters and gave him $20, the individual would be content because they had earned the $20. Maybe they might have thought they should have been paid more, but they would have felt that they earned the $20. And that's part of the challenge with accepting and sharing grace, is grace is something that cannot be earned or merited. It's a gift. A gift that is given in spite of any goodness or any shortcomings we exhibit. And that's the point behind Jesus' and Peter's discussion, as well as the parable. Forgiveness and grace cannot be earned. You cannot apply conditions to forgiveness and grace. We cannot repay the debt for our sins. Only Christ on the cross could do that. And the thing about forgiveness is if forgiveness is conditional, if we say, well, I'll forgive you if, da, 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 or I'll pardon you if you do these things, well, then it's not forgiveness because it's not grounded in grace. And if grace is based on merit or meeting certain conditions, then it's not grace. There's no way that servant could have repaid the king. And putting him in prison, that wouldn't have helped to repay his debt. It would have broken up his family, no matter how much time was given. The servant's situation was hopeless. The king's response was therefore pure grace. Although the second servant could have repaid the forgiven servant, that's a moot point. What transpired in the parable, the reason for that parable was to point out the forgiven servant's behavior. His actions, not forgiving the other person, that showed that he never really accepted the grace that he was given himself. In other words, he cheapened the grace. And that's problematic for us as Christians. Now, What happens when a child receives an unexpected surprise? They're usually filled with joy. There's an excitement that just bubbles over. They they radiate a happiness. They tell others about it. It's kind of infectious. And that's Stephen's, Stephen's motivation for passing out the $20. You didn't earn it, but it's a blessing. It's a surprise in and of itself, and I want you to have it. And I really don't want it back at the end of service. (laughs) But I encourage you to receive it like a little child. Enjoy it. Imagine the possibilities. Well, not while you're listening to the sermon, but (laughs) afterwards, think about what you can do with it. And you can do whatever you wish. No limits. 
Grace is sufficient in and of itself. But grace, when truly accepted, when truly received, naturally edifies and uplifts one's soul. Martin Luther, one of the great reformers, said, This grace of God is a very great, strong, mighty, and active thing. Grace doesn't lie asleep in the soul. Grace hears, leads, drives, draws, changes, works all in humanity, and lets itself be distinctly felt and experienced. Grace is often hidden, but its works, its effect, its impact is always evident. If someone opens a door, even partially, you can see beyond the door and experience a bit of what you see. If it's only partially ajar, you can't get all the way through to see and experience all the possibilities beyond you. Jesus said we're to receive the kingdom of God and to enter it. And the same thing applies to grace. It's not just enough to simply receive it. You need to open yourself to the ways it can transform you. You need to enter into that state of grace that's been offered you and live it out. It's like taking the $20, celebrating it as eagerly as a child would, celebrate that gift and take it and use it and do something beautiful with it, weaving it compassionately and lovingly into God's creation. Grace can be difficult sometimes to accept. I admit it, I sometimes struggle accepting grace. Sometimes it's hard to digest. Sometimes it's hard to share. Emotions, our self-image, our own awareness of our limitations, our ego, even our memory. Memory's a hard one. These things can be obstacles to receiving and sharing grace. Sometimes we have a tendency to keep condemning ourselves even after we've been forgiven by God. Other times, we focus on our limitations and, yes, we put up blinders to see how God is loving us in other ways. Failing to appreciate grace can lead us to lack empathy for others. It can stunt our growth, can stunt our progress, and it can also leave us wandering and placing our trust in other gods to satisfy our needs. Now, I really thought about preaching on Exodus today, but I wanted to save that for our newsletter articles. And I decided that instead I would focus a little bit on on grace. But I will say this about the the Red Sea passage. If you'll notice, when, when Kathy read the passage of the Israelites passing through the Red Sea, It's interesting that when they cross over into the promised land, they cross through the water to the promised land. It's interesting in the New Testament when Jesus is, it's only after Jesus is baptized that he goes into the wilderness. And yet here, something amazing is happening. And they're going through on dry land. And they see all the turmoil around them and the death and the loss. and, And they're scared. But even in that moment... That dry land is grace-filled. Even in that moment where they're most scared, there's words of Moses from God reassuring them to stand firm and be faithful. They're reminded that they're not alone. God is with them, behind them, with them, ahead of them. Helps to change their perspective on what lay ahead. And that's what grace does. Even in the wilderness, the emptiness, and the longing. Grace is still there. Even when it seems that we're far from the goal or destination. Even when we don't like the circumstances we're in, whether it's in our life or dealing with congregational vacancies, there's still grace being offered to us day after day, telling us that we belong, that we are God's child that God is with us. There's grace to be found 
received, and shared. C.S. Lewis once said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun, S-U-N, has risen, not only because I see the sun, but because by the sun I see everything else. In our faith, we believe that in Christ we've been set free as forgiven people. And as Christ's disciple, as God's children, we believe that we've been equipped and enabled to see humanity and creation as God sees it. That's how we've been designed. That's how we're meant to see. And we're meant to share, to radiate that divine grace that's within us towards others. We believe that in, death, in Christ's death and resurrection, God's mission and purpose for the world is made known. Not only does God make possible for the redemption of humanity, but so too does God pave the way for the restoration of creation as a whole. Because of Christ's sacrifice for our sins on the cross, grace has moved into our hearts so that guilt, fear, doubt, and other forms of sin and failure and brokenness can move out. Because grace has been poured out into our lives, we, like the Israelites, have moved from a kind of bondage to a new kind of bonding with God and the world God created. We can't make this grace up for ourselves. It has only one source. And, if received and rightfully treated and accepted with joy and hope, it can only impel us to move towards God's vision and transforming hope for the world. And now to the one who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.